So first of all, I'd just like to um, thank you for making the time uh, to attend today's webinar. Um, my name's Nikki Rose. I'm a clinical psychologist. I've been working in the Trust for nearly 20 years now, um, and I am, uh, as Tammy said, uh, part of the um, staff mental health and wellbeing hub and we are running this series of 12 workshops on a whole host of topics that we thought may be beneficial um, to all of our ICS colleagues so that's all of us in the National Health Service, social services, care providers, uh, local councils, a whole host of, of individuals and so today we thought it would be helpful to talk a bit about how um, any of us who are in positions where we are managing other staff or have some sort of responsibility for supporting others' mental well-being, what might be helpful for us to, to know? Um, I mean, I'm going to uh, in, try and embed um, the themes that are up on the screen at the moment throughout the um, presentation. So uh, we'll start off with having a, a look at why um, mental well-being is important in the workplace, uh, how we can support others' um, mental well-being, and, um, and, and, and look at some important and, and realistic strategies as well. One of the, I know one of the issues is that we, you know, we, we're often uh, given lots of advice, but it's, it's not um, very accessible perhaps to what we're able to do. So I think it is important to acknowledge um, why mental well-being is important that of our staff. So here I've got some uh, quotes that are from uh, NHS workers, social care providers and social service staff. So NHS workers across the country have spoken to us about feeling overstretched, undervalued and struggling to get support in a chaotic system. I think people generally feel overworked and undervalued in the NHS. There are problems with recruitment and retention. Vacancies are unfilled for more than a year. Stress levels on staff in under-resourced teams is massive um, and it's a major contributor to them struggling with their mental health and well-being. Ultimately, people make the decision to leave or take early retirement or seek other careers. So those are from some NHS staff, but it's it's across the board, really. So, you know, for the first time in history, there are now more people leaving than joining the NHS. Analysis of the NHS digital figures have reported that there is a record number of at least 400 staff a week in England leaving. Um, and the majority of, of those staff are citing, uh, they are doing so to improve their work-life balance, and that's the main reason that they're going. And this equates to uh, about 50 in every thousand, ten, 50 in every 10,000, sorry, staff working in hospitals and community mental health services in June last year actually left the service within three months citing work-life balance is the reason and that was also a new record in terms of turnover. So in terms of our social service colleagues, um, again hard to get work-life balance, there is pressure to do the number of visits, it's not focused on quality, you can't get work done in set hours and it's even hard to use toil um, there by a newly qualified social worker. Um, with a social work academic stating, I'm concerned about the culture in social work organisations that have expectations of long hours, no breaks, weekend working, no work-life balance. Students are often being inducted into this way of working while still on placement. And it is no wonder that the average number of years before burnout for social workers is seven years, which really is, is not very long in somebody's career. And then again, with our um, social care provider colleagues, almost every employer that we spoke to described of having gaps in their workforce that they were struggling to fill. Some employers interviewed, especially smaller providers, said they were seriously concerned about the future um, and that 
you know, they'd seen similar care providers go out of business. We are now in a current retention and recruitment crisis in which four in 10 social workers anticipate quitting the profession within the next five years a result, as a result of these high caseload stress and a negative working environment. And, you know, I'm sure many of us are aware um, that the um, nurses are looking to, to strike for the, the first time in, in a very significantly long time. So what I do want to um, acknowledge is that, 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 you know, there is a recognition that we are in um, this very, very difficult and challenging situation. And I don't want to um, come on today and say it's all down to the responsibility of those of you who are um, on the call as managers um, as people responsible for others' well-being to be able to put this right. If we look at the next slide, the thing that I really want us to be able to focus on initially is the fact that all of these issues have to set within an organisational context. So, you know, supporting staff uh, well-being, it has to come from the top. It has to be a top-down strategy. Um, we really need organisations to proactively promote mental well-being. And this needs to, to be embedded um, in all of the business strategies, um, in all of the policies and the practices that are in all of our services. You know, this is not something that um, can purely be left to managers and leaders and those of us in positions of, of being um, responsible for other we uh, staff wellbeing. The research suggests that those organisations which do do well with regards to this are those that are getting out there and doing this preventative and proactive strategic approach. And that's what we need to be doing. So we need to think about in that context um, a number of uh, key points really, uh, which would really benefit all of us um, to, to have improved mental wellbeing at work. Um, one of the most important of these really is what we refer to as workplace culture. And this is imperative um, for staff to have the opportunity and the confidence to speak up. But it's not just about whether or not we have the opportunity and the confidence to speak up. Um, it's whether then what we're saying is matched with a culture in which the organisation demonstrates that they're not just listening, although that's very important to get a sense that, that staff are being listened to, but also that any feedback is being actioned upon. Um, you know, I'm sure we're all very aware um, that, that we have, have been speaking up for a good while about a lot of things that, that might be um, presenting us challenges in the workplace. So we really need this workplace culture of where we not only feel OK to speak up, know that we'll be heard and know that that will have some sort of impact. Um, another big organisational context in terms of mental well-being at work is, is the workload that, that we're all experiencing as well. You know, there are a whole host of factors that have contributed to many of us experiencing much greater workload than ever we have before. And in fact, the recent research should, suggests that work overwhelm is one of the key factors to contributing to burnout and people leaving which then in turn means that the people remaining experience an increase in workload and it becomes a vicious cycle with um, a diminishing staff pool. So the NHS people plan and, and there is a recognition of, of social care providers and staff um, in this wider context as well, um, has got very clear strategies um, for us to look at workload going forward. There are strategies for 22, 23, 
um, which aim to embed a more preventative approach to health and well-being of staff, tackling inequality and looking um, at locking in these beneficial changes and new ways of working. Um, there is a an increasing recognition that we do need to attract and retain more people, that if we think about succession planning, a lot of millennials and research on what millennials um, really value is that they are working for organisations that value them and listen to them um, and, and, and very wisely take their mental health and well-being very seriously. So there are other um, key aspects as well, things such as our job quality and role autonomy, you know, how, how able we feel to get on with our day-to-day -day work. And also, and this is where we start to think uh, more so about what we can do um, if we're responsible for others' um, well-being, is that there, are, there is a recognition that employers and employees um, find it very, very difficult to tackle mental health um, and mental ill health head on. So in a recent um, survey, only 51% of line managers said they were comfortable to talk generally in the workplace about mental health, mental health issues, you know, which means that, that you know, 49% of, of line managers are not able to have those conversations. 70% of managers say that there are barriers to them providing mental health support. And, and these cover a whole host of things like fear of being judged, their own stress, lack of confidence and stigma. Um, and, and again, the research supports that staff are actually much more likely to seek um, support for musculoskeletal issues than they are over mental health. So, so these are all organisational level issues that, that really, you know, we need to acknowledge are out there because sometimes I think we lose sight of the fact that we need a lot more perhaps going forward to help us really tackle this, um, this growing concern. <laughs> so, just thank you. So, what I think is evidence is no matter where we're at with the organisational context, there's certainly a recognition that any of us who are managers, leaders, um, within the, the public sector have a real vital role in determining the health and well-being and engagement of our teams and you know we, we, we have our day jobs and for many of us on top of that we, we have these demands of um, working with some really really complex issues actually you know things like people um, experiencing bereavement, team conflict, sickness absence and mental health issues and how we're able to um, work with those issues as they arise in our um, workplace will have a really, really big impact on the health and well-being of our team. So, you know, as a manager, um, our behaviour and the culture that we create is is one of the biggest influences on an employee's work experience when asked. So, you know, straight away that makes us feel really quite um, responsible for ensuring that we're doing um, everything we can, really. So what more can we do? So these five areas have been um, highlighted really as key um, behavioural um, indicators that determine health and wellbeing engagement of, of our teams. And, you know, I. I don't think these are going to come as a shock to anybody. However, I, I certainly don't think it's um, it's not worth repeating because I think the more and more um, diminished as a workforce we potentially come and the more burnt out and the more stressed. These are some of the behaviours that can very easily start to become diluted as we struggle with our own health and well-being. So, Acknowledging that if we can turn up to work and engage with an attitude of care and respect towards our working colleagues, that we bring compassion. And I am going to talk a little bit more about self-compassion and compassion to others a little later. 
wisdom um, and kindness. And, and as I say, there's nothing groundbreaking here. Um, it's, it's what I'm sure we, uh, yes, definitely. Um, sorry, just responding to a, a, a chat post. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really worth remembering that all of these are something that it cannot, um, we cannot let slip because they really, really do make a difference to workplace culture. So one of the things that I often get asked um, when I go into teams to talk about um, helping teams work through some of these challenges is, oh, what about a resilience workshop? And don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm very pro upskilling and uh, staff training in a whole host of ways. Um, but I do think we need to be mindful of some of, as I say, the wider issues with um, staff health and well-being, because when we talk about resilience, we're actually talking about an individual's ability to recover from or stay well in really, really challenging um, situations. And, you know, we're, we're still um, reeling from the impact of the pandemic and Brexit and um, austerity and cost of living and war, you know, it, it's all sort of in the background and, and making our jobs increasingly difficult. And so when we talk about resilience in the workplace, we're asking, you know, do the staff have the capacity to thrive rather than just survive in high stress environments? So it's, it's something that is um, variable to one person and another. And although some people might be able to um, benefit from developing their resilience, I think we have to be really, really mindful in not using resilience almost as a panacea. You know, the, the owner should not be on um, staff to you know, just toughen up, you know, be more resilient. Because I think I think the majority of us are really resilient. We're still here. We're still turning up. We're still doing it. And I think in the context of what we've experienced, that shows a huge degree of resilience and the context in which staff are working their colleagues, their work content, their working environment, and all of these organisational factors will also affect resilience. So yes, let's enable staff to practice and, and to, to learn strategies that will help, but it needs to be a little more robust um, in the long term than, than, than a few resilience workshops. So what can we do? Now, Leading by example is an absolutely great way to embed um, healthy work behaviours. And this, this is a win-win because if we are leading by example, if we are demonstrating and modelling what we want our teams to do, we are also doing those things that are going to benefit. So, it, you know, I, I really um, encourage people not to think of the leading by example as, oh, that's another thing I've got to do. It's also a thing that you can do for you. So taking care of your own well-being and doing so visibly sends a really important message to the people that we are working with. And in fact, um, some um, recent research from a, a local wellbeing provider found the staff um, and, and the black country, black country staff um, uh, uh, filled in a lot of, of these uh, surveys actually, um, said that the biggest barrier to them self-caring was the fact that their managers don't do it. Their managers don't turn up to the resilience workshops, the webinars, you know, the managers are there at the start of the day, the end of the day, they don't take breaks. And although managers and leaders were frequently saying, you know, please look after yourselves, please take your breaks. It didn't feel safe enough to do so because it wasn't being modelled. So it's a real important way of us to say to, to, to our colleagues, this is OK. You know, create time in your working day for exercise. And, you know, most of us are lucky if we, we grab 15, 20 minutes at lunch. But it can be a bit of chair yoga, standing up and down, going up and down the stairs, walking around the block, 
doing activities that help reduce stress and burnout. None of us are immune from 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 this. It's you know it's it's the sort of thing we need to to be an integral part of our day to day. Take time to rest and recharge. You know, take those lunch breaks. Use your full leave um, annual leave entitlement. You know, we, we should be looking away from our computers. Um, I think it's ten minutes out of every every hour. You know, get up, have a walk around. There are things that we need to be doing. Um, you know, some of the research that I've read are eating on your desk. Apparently, most keyboards contain more germs than your average toilet floor. Um, so if that's not going to get you eating, yeah, eating away from your desk, seriously, you'd be better off sitting in your car um, if you haven't got um, a, a correct environment somewhere. So moving on. There are loads of new um, legislation around flexible working opportunities. Um, and, and again, you know, I think we're thinking about succession planning. We're thinking about the complex lives of, that, you know, we all have. We all have other um, pulls and responsibilities outside of work. So see if there are ways that you can um, have a better work life balance. Take the time to reflect on your own stress levels. When we feel we have a responsibility for checking everybody else is OK, we're probably doing that at, at work. We're probably also doing that at home in quite a number of ways. And we just keep going. So knowing our own warning signs about when we're struggling um, and how, how we're managing to address or are we managing to address these stresses is really important and bring compassion to yourself. And this is, you know, compassion, including awareness, self-kindness and a recognition that sometimes things are just really, really difficult. Um, you know, I, I, I think Sometimes there can be a real sense that if we're struggling, we're failing and it's something to do with us, as opposed to all of these other external factors um, that contribute to that as well. And I think just acknowledging that and going forward with a bit of self-compassion and kindness can make us feel, you know, less incompetent. We're not incompetent. We're not not resilient. OK, hey, what else have we got? We've got take time off when unwell. The number of people turning up to work when unwell and when they don't feel well enough to work is absolutely soaring, particularly since hybrid working, because it's so much easier now for us to log on at home, even if we're feeling awful. So pre-COVID, we'd have rung in sick and we'd have, you know, had time to lie on the sofa, put a box set on and recharge and allow our immune system to start to move us towards health. What we now do, increasingly in my experience anyway, is go, well, I'm, you know, I'm coughing and spluttering or I'm not actually physically well enough to get up and get dressed and drive into work. But don't worry, I'll log onto my computer and continue to work on my stuff from here. And that's not recuperative. That's not helpful. Um, avoid logging on and answering work calls or messages when on annual leave. And again, this is something that has been made so, so much easier with technology. You know, people that know me will know that I'm an advocate of getting rid of teams off your iPads, off your personal phones, turning phones off the second you, you finish work. You know, bring, bring those boundaries back in, because by doing that, you are protecting your time to, to nurture yourselves, but you're also sending a very, very strong message to your team that that's what you expect them to be doing as well. Not working excessive hours um, and avoid emailing your employees, your staff outside of working hours. Now, I know that's not always feasible, but if you do, you know, there are now um, time delay functions on um, on t on um, Outlook. So you can say delay this email for 12 hours or, you know, you can put a signature on saying 
these are my flexible hours. Don't expect you to respond outside of your working hours. And again, I think all of these start to build up this work culture and work environment of respect, of kindness, of compassion, all of these things that the research suggests do help. Um, and by adopting these behaviours, not only are you likely to be sending a very, very strong message, as I say, but you're also doing them. You're likely to increase your own health and well-being. You are demonstrating to your staff that these behaviours are OK. You are likely to increase your capacity to bring greater compassion to your team. And this in turn is more likely to create a culture of compassion and mutual support across the team. So much research shows that staff who are healthy and well and compassionate are more likely to achieve better patient outcomes. There are no losers in, 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 in adopting these healthier working strategies and really um, ensuring that your teams and your colleagues understand that this is what we all need to be taking responsibility to do. Really important. So everything is easier if we do it collaboratively. So not only if you are modelling the behaviours, are you doing them and then your staff will start doing them and modelling them to others. Once we start to realise that we are just all in this together, um, we can start to look at how we can get all of our other colleagues on board with developing this much wider, healthier work culture. So trying to foster a really positive and compassionate and inclusive workplace environment, um, you know, can, can it help us ensure that we're, we've got a culture that supports psychological safe, safety and mental well-being? And there's a whole host of things we can do. We need to ensure active leadership and management to uh, management support and engagement. And this goes right back to the start. You know, if these strategies and the acknowledgement that staff need the time and the permission and the, the leadership the who are demonstrating that this is OK needs to come right from the top. It needs to be in our strategies. It needs to be in policy. We need to be measuring it. We need to be, um, please don't shoot me, audited on it. But, you know, because unfortunately, you know, in, in a lot of the sectors in which we work, if it's not measured, it's not counted. So we do need um, the, the, the senior executive teams to get really on board with this. We really need to increase a culture um, that, that is, is mental health literate. You know, if we are still having half of the managers fearful of a conversation with how their, their staff are feeling with regards to health and well-being, if, you know, 70 percent of, of, of staff um, managers are saying there are barriers to this. We need to keep having the conversations. You know, how are you feeling? What can we do? Let's have some time out to, to do, do the work. Have a moment, do some meditation, do some breathing. These can't be one off things. These have to be ongoing things that are embedded into the teams and into the cultures. So we can encourage and facilitate peer support um, by having like mental health champions, buddies. You can have a mental health champion in your team or somebody can do it each week and take responsibility for trying to increase hydration that week or checking in with how people are feeling or um, leading people to come away from their desks to go for lunch. These, these may sound really basic things, but actually these are things we know aren't happening and are resulting in, in a decrease in physical and mental well-being of the workforce. And we really want to support staff who manage and support others, which is many of us on this um, webinar. 
Um, now, we've got a few ideas in the hub in, in ways in which we want to do this. Um, and myself and my colleagues, um, hopefully over the next few months, we'll be looking at how we can start running some peer support, how we can start um, perhaps looking at, at, at training uh, people in compassionate leadership, um, a whole host of things like that. But if you are aware that you are finding the challenges of supporting others um, really beginning to, 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 to become a, a, you know, a, an increasing burden, then everything I'm saying today applies to your managers too. You know, this is our opportunity to make sure we're feeding back and getting the help and support we need to. We cannot just be expected to be looking out for everybody else we work with and then nobody checking in and asking us how, how we are to. And again, further information on some of the support structures that the, the Wellbeing Hub might be able to do. Um, I'm happy to, to share further information outside of the session. And we, you know, again, so we want to be encouraging staff to recognise and take action to prevent any form of discrimination too. This is about a compassionate, inclusive and positive environment in which we, we are all working and, and discrimination has no part to play in, in that or any part of society. Um, and, and again, there are lots of ways we can raise concerns. So we really need to start to acknowledge well-being must be a priority. I mean, again, this goes back to what I said at the beginning, you know, we, <laughs> we've been saying this sort of pre-COVID and we're starting, um, you know, that uh, from 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 government down really to acknowledge that this is having a terrible impact um, on so many of our public sector workers um, in, in terms of recruitment and retention, but also in terms of just how how many of the staff are feeling. And this is actually a quote from. Um, the, the government publication, um, their response to um, uh, questions has arisen from the workforce burnout and resilience in the NHS and social care um, document. We recognise that more needs to be done to support leaders and teams to create an inclusive and compassionate workplace culture for everyone that works in the NHS. We have increased the size of the NHS workforce over the last decade and this growth continues to be a key focus to ensure we meet the rise in demand for health and care services. Ensuring the NHS is well staffed with colleagues well looked after to prevent pressures becoming too great is a priority for this government and ongoing recruitment and workforce support will be central to continuing to manage the pandemic and supporting recovery in the NHS, as well as delivering the ambitions in the long term plan. So what, what, what I would again is encourage us all to do is ensure that when we are experiencing um, potentially any barriers to any of us um, getting the, the support uh, we personally need um, for our own health and well-being or support to enable us to help others, we continue to raise it as a concern through whatever channels. Um, and I know, I know that quote there particularly um, speaks with regards to the NHS, but there is also quite a long passage um, in that document um, saying the need for um, a, a social services and social care provider long term plan too, because, you know, we are all part of a system um, that, that, that is, is really reliant on one another and um, you know it's a much wider culture than than just our own little silos and i'm thinking that my uh, this is my final view on self-compassion so actually um, i added this in because this is a quote from a colleague who i saw this morning i said to them morning how are you oh, i'm okay thanks you have to be don't you no, no, you don't. You don't have to be, you know, we, we and, and we can't just be, you know, we have to 
acknowledge that we need to take time for self-compassion and that's giving ourselves the same kindness and care that we would give to a good friend acting the same way towards ourselves when we're having a difficult time or when we fail or when we notice something about ourselves we don't like that we would to somebody we really love and care for and rather than ignoring our pain with this you know you have to be um we we must start to acknowledge it's difficult and seek support where we can get it from um I mean, I've, I've said in quite a few of the workshops um the it, it's down to us as individuals to decide who we want to give the responsibility to for our health and well-being and i just wouldn't want to give all of that responsibility away to anyone I want to be the holder of that responsibility. Um, so I'm not expecting anyone to come in and ensure um, I'm OK if I'm not saying I'm, not, I'm, I'm doing fine because it, it's easy um, when we're all overworked to believe that because sometimes it's easier to believe that. So we must keep saying, actually, we need some change now, um, you know, all of these strategies could help. We need time out for this. 